when the moon covers up the bright photosphere of the sun. But this was also the opportunity, this is where I had the opportunity to notice this, this uh, correlation. This is where I noticed it for the first time. So that's why I say it's the start of an inquiry. That's why it's the first chapter in the book, The Privileged Planet. This is the first instance of this that I noticed. But first I have to give you a little background on solar eclipses. So this is just Astronomy 101. So to produce a total eclipse of the sun, you need the following. A luminous body, would be the sun in our case, an eclipsing body, the moon, an observer platform, the surface of the earth, and they have to be all the right distances apart and in a straight line of space. Now, just to remind you, uh, in a solar eclipse, the moon is between the sun and the earth. And the, so the moon casts its shadow on the surface of the earth. Um, and so if, if you notice from this diagram, you see uh, two types of shadows. Uh, one shadow is not very dark. It's called the penumbra. If you're within the penumbra on the surface of the earth, you see some part of the sun's bright disk. It's only if you're in this very narrow, dark, pen, uh, umbral re region of the shadow that you see the sun's bright this completely covered by the moon. And so you can see the faint outer atmosphere of the sun appearing, the corona, and the, even the bright stars come out. And so daylight becomes night for a few minutes. Uh, if you know anything about geometry, you notice that the fact that the darkest part of the shadow comes to an almost perfect focus on the surface of the Earth, called the umbra, indicates that the two bodies obtain almost exactly the same angle on, on the sky, namely the moon and the sun. So the moon and the sun both have ten almost exactly the same angle. If, if you think back when you last time you saw the full moon rising above a clear horizon or, and the, or the sun setting or rising, have you noticed how big they appear in the sky in angle? They're pretty similar to each other. In fact, they're almost exactly the same angle on the sky. They're half a degree. Have you ever thought about that? You ever pondered, why do the moon and the sun appear the same angle on the sky? That's an interesting coincidence. Why, why is it that the moon and the sun both attend the same? The two very different sorts of objects. The sun is a big ball of gas, uh, about 1.4 million kilometers in diameter, and the moon is a much, much smaller object, much, much closer to the Earth that's made up of rock. Well, there's a reason they attend the same angle in the sky, and it's not just a coincidence. And this is a discovery I made, and I wrote it up in a paper in a journal called Astronomy and Geophysics in 1999. I made a connection between our existence on Earth as observers and our ability to observe eclipses. There's actually a connection between the two. Here's how it works. First, let me just show you a comparison between uh, solar ecl uh, eclipses as seen from the Earth's surface and eclipses as seen from other planets in the solar system with moons. So on the left, you see all the planets labeled there from Earth to Pluto. Oops, I forgot to remove Pluto. It's an old slide. <laughs> Forgive me. I'll have to update it. Uh, but um, all the planetary bodies with moons. And there is uh, the horizontal axis is the ratio, angular size ratio, between the, the moon or satellite and the sun as seen from the surface of that planet. And so 1.0 means there's a perfect match in angle on the sky. Notice that the moon uh, crosses that central dotted line right down the middle. So the moon has, a, as I already said, a perfect match in angular size to the sun. And then Mars has two moons that are too small, so on the, they're on the left. They're Phobos and Deimos. And then there are other moons that are too big. Uh, they produce what I call super eclipses. Only one other moon, Prometheus, uh, touches that central line. And it's one of the shepherd moons on the edge of the rings of Saturn. It's a small potato-shaped moon that orbits around Saturn very quickly, and so it produces very, very brief eclipses. For a variety of reasons, we get the best eclipses, actually, in the solar system from the surface of the Earth. Earth is the closest planet to the sun that has a moon. And so we get to see uh, eclipses with the largest angle on the sky in the solar system. Also, the moon orbits around the Earth relatively slowly because the Earth is a relatively low-mass planet compared to the size of the moon. Jupiter is 320 times the mass of the Earth, and so its moons whip around pretty quickly. And so uh, the moon is also a very round profile on the sky, so it gives us uh, nice, perfect eclipses, as I call them. But so the Earth is the best place in the solar system to view eclipses. And the Earth is also the most habitable place in the solar system. Could that just be a coincidence, or is there a link between those two? 
Oh, I forgot I added this. Uh, these are the only, uh, we only n have seen eclipses from the surface of one other planet, and that's from Mars, photographed with the Opportunity rover back in 2004. And so this is what uh, eclipses from the surface of Mars look like, and you can see uh, their moons are much smaller than the sun, just as I noted earlier in that previous slide. So here's the connection between life on Earth and observability of eclipses. The Earth's location in the, in the circumstellar habitable zone sets the angular size of the sun in the sky. In other words, by the very fact that the Earth has to be a habitable planet that we live on, that already constrains how big the sun must look in our sky. Because we have to be within the circumstellar habitable zone. It's a certain range of distances where you can maintain liquid water on the surface of a terrestrial planet. So that establishes how big the sun looks. I mentioned earlier that uh, the presence of the moon around the Earth stabilizes the total of its rotation axis. So the presence of the moon, and that's not the only thing it does for us. It does other things, like the tides, that makes uh, the, Earth, um, the Earth a more habitable planet. So a moon large enough and close enough to cover the sun and the sky helps keep the climate stable. It makes the Earth a much more habitable planet. Therefore, if you satisfy the requirements for complex life on a planet having to do with the sun and moon, you're likely also to satisfy the requirements for a total solar eclipse. In other words, there's an overlap between the things you need for life on a planet and the things you need for a solar eclipse at a very fundamental level of physics. Okay, it's built into uh, the fundamental physics of the universe. And it goes beyond that even. Uh, eclipses have been uh, important in advancing science. Perhaps the most famous example is the first test of general relativity. In 1919, uh, Arthur Eddington, an astronomer, observed a uh, total eclipse of the sun and photographed it and photographed stars around the sun. As I mentioned earlier, you can see stars come out uh, in the sky during a total eclipse of the sun. And so he took pictures of the stars around the sun during a total eclipse, and then he came back later and observed that same patch of sky when the sun was out outside, away from that part of the sky, six months later. And he compared the positions of the stars, and he found that they were shifted and confirmed the prediction from Einstein uh, that light would bend around a massive body, like starlight behind the sun, or for stars near the sun, rather, uh, having their trajectories bent by the sun's gravity. And that since was confirmed in other eclipses after that as well. But uh, it was that confirmation that led to the very rapid acceptance of general relativity uh, in the early part of the 20th century, probably the single most important theory in all of physics. And it's a foundation for modern cosmology. So concluding this first example, the requirements for producing perfect solar eclipses which provide scientific insight also contribute to the Earth's habitability. And so, but this is only one example where the conditions for habitability overlap the conditions for measurability. Or in other words, conditions for life overlap the conditions for doing science. A uh, second example concerns a bigger scale. Uh, this is an issue of Scientific American where I wrote an article uh, on the galactic habitable zone with my colleagues Don Brownlee and uh, Peter Ward, who are also authors of the book Rare Earth. The basic idea is the following. There are two broad categories of phenomena that define the galactic habitable zone. First are the requirements for a habitable planet. What, it, what sorts of things do you need to build a habitable planet? What sorts of elements and how much of them do you need to build a habitable planet? And the second one is the survival of complex life in the face of uh, dangerous events in the history of the galaxy. First, let me give you a little background on the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way just derives from this band of faint, it looks especially faint on, on this projector, light, a uh, band of faint light that looks like clouds in the night sky. That's all right. Uh, we can keep it like that. Uh, this is just a wide-angle fisheye lens photograph of the night sky. How many of you have seen the Milky Way at night on a dark sky away from the city? Okay. So that's where it gets its name from. But if you look at it through a telescope, the, the milky clouds actually break up into thousands of stars. Uh, here's a cartoonish representation of what the uh, galaxy would look like if you could look at it from uh, perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy looking out. Say a bird's eye view. 
even though a bird could not survive 50,000 light years above the plane of the galaxy. And so you can see that the position of the sun is between two spiral arms. That's important uh, because spiral arms are actually dangerous places where you don't want to be uh, uh, crossing uh, too often or staying in too long. And generally, the inner regions of the galaxy are much more dangerous. You have a higher rate of supernovae there. There's a giant black hole at the center of the galaxy that occasionally spews out dangerous radiation. And the density of stars is much greater towards the center of the galaxy and a few other nasty things. And here's an edge-on view of the galaxy. The galaxy is actually highly flattened, like a pancake. Uh, in fact, its thickness is only about 1% the diameter of the disk. We're located about a little more or roughly halfway from the center to the visible edge of the disk of the galaxy.